Hello, I am happy to share some good news of a case report we have just published on DHEA treatment for recurrent miscarriage. The paper was published yesterday, the 15th of February, and I'd like to share with you the story of the couple that we treated and published our paper on. It's in Frontiers in Medicine, and it, it's a long, complicated title, but basically it's a couple who had six pregnancies, one live birth and five pregnancy losses, and how we solved their problem of recurrent miscarriage with DHEA treatment. The couple had their first appointment with us in January of 2022. And as part of their history, when they had four pregnancy losses, they presented to a miscarriage clinic in Dublin and had extensive investigations at that time. Her first pregnancy ended in miscarriage at eight weeks gestation in February of 2012. She had a live birth delivered by C-section in 2014, and then she had three additional losses two at eight weeks and the last one at 16 weeks. When they investigated, they found there was a chromosomal abnormality in the last miscarriage. Apart from that, all other investigations were completely normal. Thrombophilia screen, karyotyping, thyroid function, and all the usual blood tests at the miscarriage clinic failed to find a cause for the miscarriages. So after extensive investigations, she was greatly reassured and told, go ahead and try again, you should be okay. Tragically, she had another pregnancy loss, a much later one at 24 weeks gestation. So this was her profile when she presented to our clinic, uh, and I'm sure you would agree, a difficult and challenging history. And the principles we use are restorative reproductive medicine, and we keep asking, why, why, why did this happen? we start to do new things that aren't routinely practiced at miscarriage clinics. So I'll try and share what we did. So thankfully, we achieved a successful pregnancy. She had a planned C-section delivered in November past, had a healthy boy, uh, six pounds and 12 ounces, and everything went fine. So how did we do it? Well, first, we asked the couple to download our app at chartneo.com to record the key biomarkers of her fertility cycle. This is best completed with the help of a trained fertility advisor to make sure you observe and record accurately. And we built up a profile of what her individual cycle looks like, and this is key for us. And I'll show you as the case progresses. Three things that we found that were previously undetected. Number one, low DHEA. Number two, low endorphins and number three, low progesterone. Each of them has a part to play. Maybe we could have got success just treating one of these, but if you implement a multifactorial assessment and treatment strategy, you tend to get a better outcome. The detection of low DHEA was relatively easy. We refer to this as hypoandrogenemia, meaning that her androgen levels were low in her blood. And this was obvious from a simple blood test. You could see the DHEA sulfate was down at 1.8 and it's considered low if it's below 2.7. And her testosterone levels, we didn't get an exact reading, but they were at the low end of the scale. We treat this with DHEA 25 milligrams twice daily and this improves egg quality preconception. So that would reduce her risk of having a baby with a chromosomal abnormality. Clinically, she had symptoms of low endorphins, so it's a clinical judgment, and I treated her with low-dose naltrexone to boost her endorphins, and this has an anti-inflammatory immune-modifying effect as well. It also relieves things like fatigue and premenstrual symptoms, so that's a key thing, and I, I give that based on her clinical picture. There's no blood test I can do to prove that. And the third thing we did was we assessed the quality of her ovulation. This is a concept that a lot of doctors in particular struggle with, and it's different than the day 21 standard that most doctors are trained in. And you can see the difference here that we look for the maximum surge of progesterone and estrogen between six and nine days after the ovulation event. We need her to pick her ovulation event with the help of our app. So when she identifies the day of what we call presumed ovulation, 
then we know when to get the timed blood test and we use a higher reference range and we check estrogen as well as progesterone. So it's a relatively simple strategy, but it allows us to detect subtle hormone deficiencies that otherwise pass undetected. And if you don't identify and treat these deficiencies, you're going to have a higher risk of a future miscarriage. So here's her cycle. She had an ovulation event on day 17 of her cycle and her bloods taken five days after that were below our ideal target range. Uh, it's normal by day 21 standards. It's ovulatory because the progesterone is above 30, but it's suboptimal ovulation because the progesterone doesn't quite reach her level of 60. So that combined with her late ovulation event and her suboptimal hormones, that would indicate to us that she needs some follicular stimulation. We'd already started her on DHEA for her hypoandrogenemia and we had already started her on low dose naltrexone and clinically a lot of couples report back to us feeling much better less fatigue less pms and a better mood and better sleep would be common things we would hear so to improve her hormones um, eventually i opted for clomiphene uh, in fact i initially started her with letrozole but unusually that didn't agree with her so we switched to clomiphene together with trigger HCG mid-cycle and luteal phase HCG on days three, five, and seven after the ovulation event. Most importantly, we monitor the impact of this treatment. So I could tell by ultrasound that we achieved follicle rupture of a single mature follicle. Um, and in addition, we could check her bloods seven days later and confirm that her suboptimal progesterone is now comfortably in our target normal range. So our strategy is I want her to feel good. I want her fertility pattern to look good. I want to verify follicle rupture of a single mature follicle by ultrasound and balanced hormones. Um, she was on the DHEA and naltrexone for two months before she was ready to try to conceive. And then uh, we were happy for them to begin to use the fertile time. Phase three can be as quick as one cycle, as long as 12 cycles or anywhere in between. So the challenge is if it doesn't happen quickly, it's okay. Persist with cycle balancing. It will happen with a history like yours. It's more of a question of when rather than if. On our second cycle of using the fertile time, they achieved a positive pregnancy test. As it turns out, they weren't able to assess their hormones on day seven after ovulation for that cycle. But we could see she didn't ovulate on day 14, she ovulated on day 19. So we use a corrected LMP date five days after her actual LMP in order to indicate that fertilization was 14 days after that. Every day, every millimeter counts for these early stages of pregnancy. During her pregnancy, we continue treatment with DHEA, 20 milligrams once daily, as well as progesterone, cyclogest twice a day, and naltrexone at night. We have given naltrexone during pregnancy for over 20 years safely, and we get better outcomes and fewer miscarriages with it. We monitored her hormone levels every week for progesterone, estradiol, and HCG. And by the time she had her third blood sample tested, we could tell looking at her blood test results, we were 90% confident of having a good ultrasound scan. We have a graph that we follow uh, in order to guide us. Are we confident that hormone levels are good and balanced? Because it's all about balance. We don't want hormones going either too high or too low. And we titrate the DHEA dose according to her estradiol levels during pregnancy. This is her ultrasound scan at seven weeks. And the crown rump length of her embryo was perfectly what it should be consistent with seven weeks gestation, just under one centimeter in size. And this never gets old to see a little heartbeat of a, a new human being at just one centimeter in size. is just fascinating and um, a, a wonderful time for um, parents when they see this. And um, it's also still a worrying time because remember, she went to 24 weeks. So a couple like this won't be happy until they're holding baby in hand, uh, which is understandable. A follow-up ultrasound confirmed the pregnancy was progressing well. But another key thing that we do is we continue to monitor progesterone and estrogen right throughout the pregnancy. And this is why we continued her DHEA because 
Her levels were just properly balanced with the DHEA treatment, and her concern was if we'd stop DHEA, then uh, estrogen levels would fall and we'd have an increased risk of an adverse pregnancy outcome. So the DHEA preconception improved egg quality during pregnancy, maintained estrogen levels throughout the pregnancy. And even as pregnancy progressed, we were confident that she was likely to have a full term healthy pregnancy, which thankfully she did. Thank you for watching this presentation.